You beat me to it, Mark. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Peter Schrappen, the co-host of Seattle Boat Show Live, episode 35 of this fun endeavor that I get to get to partake in with my friends, Mark Bunzel and the Landons. Hey, Mark. Hey, Peter. How are you? What's happening in Olympia this week? Yeah, we uh, passed a big cutoff date, and so bills that did not get out of committee are considered dead for the most part for, for this session. And, the and I think one of ours that we really cared about died, didn't it? You'll, you'll have to remember which one of those that we cared about. There were been a whole bunch of, there's been about there a thousand were a whole bills. Bunch. Yeah, this one a dealt thousand. with the voters uh, registration card. Yeah, the mandatory voter education card, which would require, uh, actually would, ex currently there's an exemption for anyone born after 1955 that you do not need to get the cards. This bill would change that and take out that exemption part. And then also it'd require mandatory voter education for all human powered paddlers and um, anyone on a sailboat below 16 feet and 10 horsepower Pack, paddle boards I paddle mean it boards, was crazy paddle, paddle. yeah it was a big bill it, it, had, it ended up not moving out of committee so it's it's you don't really want to say anything's dead in it because it can resurface if you put your guard down but yeah those two senate and house bills did not make it out of committee um, there's a whale watching bills there's pinniped bills which is like a fancy word for uh, seals there's a, a lot of seal populations around the columbia river and puget sound that are munching on salmon so there's um who lobbies for the seals? It's a tough issue. Um, Humane Society would be an example of someone. Okay. That, and legislators are pre. Everyone loves seals, so it's kind of a tough issue optics-wise to uh, say that you're for t taking out seals, and they're in, in part of the endangered species taxonomy. So, um, but if you look at the math and the fact that salmon populations are declining, you get to that Y part of the equation, you could start to think about the pinniped problem, the pinniped the pinniped problem. Yeah, mm. pinnipeds sound better. It sounds more scientific, I think, than seals because you think seals, you think, yeah, you think about cute little harbor seals that you would never want to do anything harmful to. So, so yeah, that was I've that's seen, an issue. I've seen the mess that they can make on a boat. So I, yeah. I've seen the ugly part of the uh, pinniped population. Okay. How's that for, uh, that's for a radio well, voice? Next Say time I need uh, someone to testify, Mark, I will give you a jingle and we can have you. Uh, I can you say testify. pinniped population. That's right. Uh, so yeah, that, that bill, that's 5404. That's moving forward. Um, we'll see. Um, there's a whale watching bills, Mark, that uh, would allow the whale watching industry that currently they're going to need to get licensed and this would give them some breathing room on, on paying those license fees. Yeah, so I testified pro on that one. That's another important issue that's got optics on all sides. Everyone loves the whales and also everyone um, a lot of boat lovers appreciate the role that the whale watching company plays and that sentinel role, another big word. That's kind of a, as a beacon for boaters to stay clear. When you see a whale watching boat there, you know that like time out, you should go no further than the whale watching boat. So there's really two schools of thought. Do you see the whale watching companies as sentinels or not? And NMTA and Arbaugh, the Recreational Boating Association of Washington think they are. So we've been um, aligned at the hip with the whale watching uh, charter industry. So that, yeah, a Good. couple of bills there. Um, that's an important issue in Anacortes and a lot of yes, it is. Yes, it communities is. And um, that, those bring in a lot of dollars, and they, yeah, we like their partnership with the whale watching industry. So anyway, that's a couple of bills that have been coming across my desk, watching. So yeah, thanks for asking. And we have how many more weeks of the legislature now? So I want to say it's at thirty nine or day thirty nine into one hundred five days. It's a long session. Oh my gosh, we're so we're early. We got yeah, a lot capital, of capital gains of tax. Expression. There's a capital gains tax afoot. Um, that would put a, we don't have income tax in Washington state. So this would be a way to put a tax on transactions when you sell a business, a 9% tax on that. So that moved out of committee before the cutoff. So that's alive. And um, so yeah, day 39 out of 105 days. And this is the same session where they write the operating capital and transportation budgets. And then next year will be a 60 day session and it also it's an election year. So yeah. 
That's a little civics, civics 201. Yeah, but it's all out of uh, everyone's respective homes where you're seeing all sorts of backdrops of normal backdrops from legislators because everyone's home as we do virtual session in Washington State, which is not true of other states like Missouri and a lot of other states are, are trying to find the right balance between how they're going about their session. So yeah. did, you get, did you get on the watermark this week? No, but the yeah. Landons did a little, well, they didn't go boating, but they had interaction with their boat. Should we leave it at that? Leonard, did you want to? We, 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 uh, you know, we were boating in a, in a small way. Um, the boat didn't leave the slip, but we were working on it. So it meets the definition of cruising. And cruising, the definition of cruising is working on your boat in exotic locations. And it's not, you know, Anacortes is semi-exotic. So, but anyway, we've been working on the boat quite a bit. Getting it ready. So, and I, I think this is a good time. This, this is the time of year that all of us have uh, boating projects going on. I had some gauges that were not working on my boat. My mechanic was trying to track them down. Leonard was trying to deal with a helicoil problem. Now, he, he can explain what a helicoil problem is on his John Deere engine. It's the solution to uh, something that probably all of us have done when you're Put, putting a bolt back in again and you tighten it down and you kind of go whoops and it goes it spins right through and you go hmm I think I stripped the, the threads out on that and it was on a part of the engine that uh, it, it's threaded into a part of the engine that's a great big cover for the whole end the front, the front of the engine so it, in order to replace the threads would replace a large part well there's a, a thing called helicoil uh, that is designed to go into the remains of the remnants of the thread and it remakes threads. I still don't quite understand exactly how, but uh, some some uh, technicians came in and uh, put the helicoil in and I have threads again. And luckily, uh, luckily it's working. But that was, a, that was an interesting one. And there was, a, yes, when I did tighten it up too tight and it slipped right through, there were a few words. It was, oh, my gosh. It's a, this is a family show at seven o'clock at night. So, right. so that's but really it's all, part of, all part of owning a boat. Yeah, Mark, that's a good point about really getting after boating activities now when you think about preparing yourself. It's sort of like buying, trying to buy that snow sled on the day before a snowstorm. Like no one ever, is, you can never find what you need having just come off of a foot of snow this past week. It was hard to find shovels and sleds and it's exactly around boating season as well now is the time like we're giving you the forecast it's going to be beautiful so take care carpe diem get out there right now and check your systems and go through the plan and talk with your boat yard now and get the bad and the boat yards are booking up they are getting busy so you're right peter definitely I, talk to the boat yard book book your time in there definitely i'd, I'd add to that exactly that that uh, they're all the book, boat yards they're busy already and they're saying there's quite a bit of backlog right now and people that didn't do a lot of cruising last year are discovering that there were things that aged out of their boats last year. There's a big one that's coming up too. I think since a number of boats sat idle last year or more idle than usual, there are a bunch of check the dates on expirations on things and uh, fire extinguishers, things that need to be uh, up to date. And I bet you're gonna find a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be updated this season. Get an early start on it. Well, Leonard, Lorena, that takes us right into very good segue. So what's <laughs> new in the world of marinas and is the border going to be open? I'm throwing <laughs> that to you because I literally well, that, get that one was, email a day, that, if not thank two. You, thank you. Well, we do have a bit of news from BC. Uh, the snowbirds, if you're a Canadian and you've gone down to enjoy the sun or elsewhere on a vacation property, Starting February 22nd, uh, when you cross the border by land, you need to come with a negative COVID test and you will be tested at the border. We assume it's one of those quick uh, instant result tests and then uh, quarantine for 14 days and test it again. If you're flying in uh, similar, you need to have a negative COVID test or you can't board the plane. And when you get there, you must stay for three days at your expense in a government approved hotel, uh, be tested and then 14 days quarantined and be tested again. So uh, they really are concerned about the COVID variant that might be coming in. 
And we, and we saw some of that uh, with uh, some folks that were contacting us. They're, they're actually, they live in South Africa. And uh, they were talking about the restrictions now that uh, they can't come in right now. So there's no provision to come into the United States right now from countries where the variants are located. So that's kind of that's kind of the, the news about you know, things that are tightening up. But then there are, I think there are some, uh, some positive signs out there that uh, some of the BC and other places at least are talking about methods by which they might be able to control this. And uh, there, was a, there was a phrase that I used, uh, somebody got back to me on uh, regarding our class we did on Southeast Alaska for the uh, virtual boat show. And there was a phrase that I had in there when I was talking about the border and I said that uh, we were hoping that this season the Canadian-U.S. border would be more porous than it was last year, and they got a kick out of that. And uh, it probably, but I think it's a very apt description of it. There was a trickle of boats going through last summer, uh, but they were they had to have an essential purpose, and we're really hoping. And I, I'm, I guess it's my expectation that there will be a little bit more going through this year. There'll be some provisions for checking. Uh, as to whether you're tested or not and have test provisions and a way to get through. So we're hoping for that, but there's nothing announced yet. So yeah, that, they, that, that that's your ask in the chat. And we encourage everyone at home to use the chat. Do you think there'll be any sort of exceptions uh, uh, regarding vaccinations or any sort of like passport? I'm sorry, that was Bob's question in the chat. Do you know we're, we're not hearing of any exceptions yet or anything related to vaccinations. vaccinations. Okay, yep. Our um, understanding is if you have a vaccination, you still need to have the test and do the 14 day quarantine. At least that's the way it is right now. Okay, thanks. And the other little update is uh, that, that uh, there was, there's one marina left in uh, Washington state that is still not accepting transient or guest moorage and that's Arabella's, Arabella's landing in Gig Harbor. Uh, now they have, there's an announcement on their Facebook that says that that uh, continues until March of this year. Uh, there's no guarantee that that's going to happen, but uh, hopefully that will be the last one that will open up. And uh, now that there's hopefully enough vaccines going around, vaccinations and some protections, but that's the updates right now. Is that's that it? it? Okay. All right. Go ahead, Peter. I was curious, Mark, if you could tell me about the rest of the show. Oh, we have more? I thought I thought you had made the arrangements. Oh, this is awkward. <laughs> this is awkward. This is why we need to have those pre-show calls, Mark. <laughs> I know, I know. No, we've got a great show lined up tonight. We've got, we get a lot of questions about different ways to communicate, especially going up and down the inside passage, but if you're going offshore. And, uh, you know, people think cellular phones are everywhere. And unfortunately, they're not. And if you're going north, and you need to stay in touch for business or family reasons, really your option comes down to satellite communications. And so we decided to dedicate this show to satellite communications. And I reached out to my expert, who is Jeff Thomason at Oceans. Uh, we talk about him every once in a while because he is the guy who handles more of the oceanic racing and other types of events than anybody else. So he's well known in the cruising circles. And, and Jeff, if you're there in the waiting area, come on in. Come on down, uh, yeah. And uh, we've got with him, uh, Jeff's wife, Katie, because uh, I looked at Jeff and I said, Jeff, we need to soften this image a little bit. And he wouldn't shave his beard so I said, well, at least bring Katie on board on to the show with it. Is Katie going to join you or did I, did I embarrass her? Yeah, I think you scared her off. She's, she bolted. <laughs> <laughs> we had a delivery come to the door and, and uh, so she had to go quiet the dog down, but uh, there, there, she oh, is. there she is. She's back. Hi, Katie. <laughs> Coming to us from Port Orchard, Washington, I believe. Yeah. yeah. It's affirmative. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And Katie, Katie is not just Jeff's wife. When, when they go on the road to talk about satellite communications, Katie can tell the story as well as Jeff. And Jeff, I think she's more effective at it than you are. Well, I've been told that by uh, many a customer. So. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, she's kind of the attraction at the booth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Katie is often in the Oceans booth and 
I first met Katie in, at the Annapolis Boat Show about eight or so years, eight or nine years ago. I don't know how long it was ago. First one was and uh, she does a terrific job. And, and uh, Jeff, you've got quite an asset. And I'm sure Oceans pays her very well when she works <laughs> the booth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not enough. They ought to at least pay for the coffee. airline ticket. I get coffee. Yeah, she gets a lot of coffee, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, uh, take me back through and for our audience. Uh, uh, Oceans, I've known of Oceans, geez, for about 12 or 15 years now as the experts in this area. But how did Oceans get into this business? Sure. Uh, well, I'll start with me. Uh, my background is boats. I've been in boats my entire life. Um, Dad used to work for Outboard Marine Corporation. And so therefore, I just kind of grew up in everything. Uh, I was working for Marine Electronics dealers uh, in Seattle, worked at Jacobson <coughs> Marine. Um, and Oceans actually started as a company that built a very specific satellite receiver for ships to download real-time satellite imagery off of the NOAA weather satellites. So no matter where that ship is in the world, they could get a real-time picture. Um, it came through similar to weather facts, but you could get a, a real-time satellite picture of the weather around you, and it was the only thing out there. So it's kind of- When was this, out. Jeff? About 15 this, years ago? Yeah, this was 96. And wow. I actually, uh, as a marine electronics guy, sold a few of these systems to some yachts um, and got to know the owner of the company. And very shortly after that, um, we decided it was a good partnership for the two of us. And I've actually been with Oceans since 2001. And, and then I brought in some of the satellite communication stuff, having done that as a marine electronics dealer. And realized that as the technology is changing with satellite phones, the prices were changing, the equipment's changing. Um, we could deliver a lot more weather information to a customer using this newer satellite phone system, much cheaper, much faster, and give them a lot more data. So we built from there, we started building this presence where now I can take, you know, some small little handheld satellite phone like this and download weather information for anywhere in the world while I am anywhere in the world. And um, just kind of took off from there. And then, of course, all the other uh, little things like tracking services, email services, things like that just kind of fall into place with that same technology. Well, well let's talk about that because... Uh, it, satellite now is not just voice. It started out, I think, with voice and then transitioned to slow data and, and a text kind of snuck into that. Uh, uh, what am I missing there uh, in the technology leap? Well, you, you're right. It, it did start out. The first uh, Iridium system went up. It was primarily voice. Uh, then very shortly, they realized that, that there were a couple other satellite players in the game um, early on, but again, still voice. And we're looking at data speeds, you know, that were slow for dial-up. You know, we were all on dial-up connections back then, and, and these were even slower than that. Well, the, the satellite companies, remember, space segments are built 10 years ahead of time. So any technology that goes up was typically built 10 years ago before it even got launched. And um, so it took a long time for this stuff to, to build up and, and be pushed out into outer space. And so they started finding ways to deliver really slow data across the system that was already up there. And, but you were limited to that. But now um, with the likes of guys like SpaceX, I'll jump right in there, um, you know, where they can turn stuff around real quick, um, you know, you can, you can develop products and get them in outer space much, much faster, which is what we're all used to with our cell phones, right? You know, my cell phone, one day it could barely do a text message and now we're surfing the whole internet on it. Well, all it took was a guy to drive over here to the hill, put a new antenna on the tower and a few components, you know, at the bottom of that antenna and you've got a whole different network. Well, in space, you know, that took a lot longer, but it, 
that stuff's starting to change. You know, we're starting to speed up with that. And, and who are the current players, the networks that are out there in space? Sure, we're, we're looking at really, um, well, now, I, now we're at five. So uh, the startup was in Marsat. They were one of the first uh, satellite communications systems that was available to the general public, you know, the maritime public. Um, you saw that with a lot of their safety systems. You saw that on a lot of the older large domes and such. Uh, next came Iridium, and they put up a constellation of satellites and, you know, started pushing a handheld device. That was revolutionary. Um, then next up, we had the likes of Global Star come out and try to compete with Iridium. Um, we then go into the VSAT type terminals, which are, think of your satellite TV at home where you've got a dish that's, that's pointed out and connecting to one particular satellite. Uh, that's what VSAT does. And there's a number of players in that field like KVH and Teleon, stuff like that, where you're buying a TV system and then people are gonna buy a matching dome that actually does communications. Um, now add into that mix, guys like uh, Elon Musk and, and the Starlink system. So we'll get to Starlink a little later on because that's. I think still in the future, and I know a number of our viewers have questions about how and when for Starlink, so we'll save that just so we keep our audience. But uh, tell me a little bit about Iridium, because Iridium, I think that was financed by the government. Uh, it was a Motorola technology. They got it up in the air during a time period where even Bill Gates had talked about building a global network of uh, LEO, low low altitude uh, uh, satellite system. And, so, and that had some fits and starts. It failed, didn't it? Yeah, and that's pretty much been the, um, the status quo for how to start a satellite communications business. Um, I challenge anyone to go find me one that has not gone bankrupt yet or before. Uh, Starlink has not gone bankrupt yet. Um, I say that because if you look at the numbers they're having, you know, they have a lot of money to build or to acquire. Um, Global Star built their system, went bankrupt. Iridium, you know, built their system, could not gain. The problem was getting enough people on the system to make it viable and pay for itself. It was so expensive to put up that uh, they couldn't sustain it on the low numbers. You know, cellular grew much faster. And people said, well, I can, for 30 bucks, I can get a cell phone, you know, for a thousand dollars, I can get a satellite phone and, and pay, you know, exorbitant airtime rates. So even MRSAT has gone through, you know, bankruptcies when they first started. So that's, there's interesting articles when you look at it, every one of them has had a bankruptcy to start out with, clear that debt off the table. Now you come in, you've got existing network to build up, and now you can slowly start building up the user base. But it's hard, you know, satellite is a little different because like cellular, you know, you can walk into a building, you still get cell signal. With satellite, you can't do that. So it, it's very different equipment and it's definitely a more unique user base. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, it, it's amazing, even the Iridium equipment today, I mean, how do you feel about it? I, I've rented Iridium gear and and uh, it's tough. It, it, it's tough to maintain a signal. Uh, uh, is it truly usable today? It is. Uh, the Iridium system right now is 100% uh, new. So they've got about 70 plus satellites up there right now. Every single one of those is brand spanking new. Um, they're within the last four years. Their original constellation outlived its life expectancy by you know, almost 10 years, believe it or not. Um, so we've got new equipment up there. We've got very robust satellites that are capable of much better voice communications and faster data speeds. And the hardware on the ground, you know, the stuff doesn't change as fast as our cell phones. Uh, so you'll see phones like these handhelds, you know, they'll stick around for 10 years. The original phones that they put out back in 1996 are still valid. They still work the same now as they did back then. 
So the newer phones, you know, on, on the smaller side of things like the, the handheld or something like the Iridium Go, you know, they're small, they're working at the same speeds the original phones were. But with this new constellation, they were able to take advantage of some new higher powered uh, ground terminals that you might put on your boat or on vehicles or on buildings and get faster data speeds. But you've got this brand new constellation of satellites that cover the entire globe. So literally anywhere on the planet, you're going to get a signal as long as you can see the sky. So Jeff, we've got a lot of our viewing audience. Uh, some are local boaters in Puget Sound and they've got cellular coverage, but I get the calls of somebody calling me and saying, hey, I, I have to go to Alaska and I've got a family member who's ill or I need to stay in touch with my office. What do you tell them? I mean, you must get these calls several times a day. Yeah, we do. Uh, they come in a, a variety of flavors. You know, one is I just need to be able to, to get back home when we're off the grid or, you know, get a message to somebody. Other times it's, I need to stay up with my entire business. And uh, you really have to break down exactly what it is you need to do because it really varies uh, between the networks and the equipment that you buy as to what its capabilities are. They're all satellite, they all gotta see the sky, but how much speed do you need? How much data do you plan on using? How much voice communications are you gonna be using up? Or how important is it that your call really never drops? Um, or nowadays with COVID, you know, can I zoom over my satellite phone from Desolation Sound? You know, they, I get that question. I've gotten oh. several calls like that. Yeah. They want to be able to do Zoom discussions over their satellite phone. And you know what I tell them? <laughs> Call Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> and then I tell them, no. I <laughs> uh, hate to be blunt, but yeah, uh, Zoom, you know, just to throw this out there, because it's the question that comes up. Uh, this type of stuff, Zoom, video chat type of thing, uses a lot of bandwidth a lot of bandwidth. You have to have uh, connections of at least a, a meg and a half um, to be able to, to do a video call without it just chopping up on you. I have customers that are using some of the high-speed Iridium systems now in an attempt to do some video chat. They're doctors and such. And the upload speeds from those devices are only, you know, they, they're going to vary between 300 kilobits and, you know, 700 kilobits. That's not enough to run a Zoom video chat. So, right. You know. So it's really not at that level yet. We really aren't at that level yet. Um, the, the closest, you know, that will, none of the existing systems are able to do that. Um, without going to a really big antenna. And you gotta remember bandwidth, satellites, it, it's, it comes down to physics at, at a certain point, right? To reach a satellite that's 22,000 miles up in the sky, you've gotta have a lot of power and you've gotta have a very focused radio beam. You know, not, not a big wide angle, it's gotta be you know, real tight. In order to do that, you need a big dome with a lot of power. So when you see the big, you know, super yachts, and I mean, you know, the guys that are 150 up and they've got those big domes, you know, they're logging into big VSAT systems where they can get, you know, five megs, you know, continuous, they can do video chat. But when you drop down to something like a KVH V3, um, like, you know, the matches, a lot of our KVH TV antennas that you see out there, that's not even powerful enough to do video chat. So, so on my 30 foot tally craft, I'm not gonna be able to do Zoom calls for a while. I'd be happy to put a big dome on that thing. I mean, I, yeah, the whole assuming boat there's would enough be going room. like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming there's enough room on that arch. We can probably squeeze something up there. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Wagner guy doesn't have the budget for that. So I That's appreciate the, the offer though. Yeah, we are, you know, domes like that, you know, you're, you're looking at numbers around $30,000, you know, whereas, you know, most of us are in the handheld range, you know, this is around $1,500, you know, 1000 to 1500 depending on the exact model you get, um, down to, to little text-only devices for, you know, three or $400. And I, I want to talk about the text-only devices in a little bit, 
uh, and come back to that because uh, I've had a great deal of success with that. And uh, but uh, so I'm glad you named some of the prices because I think that's the reality when somebody sees what the price tag is. What about the airtime today? What's that costing? The airtime is typically um, typically going to start around you know just under a hundred dollars a month. You know, 50, uh, a basic Iridium plan starts at $57 a month. That includes your first 10 minutes. Uh, you move into something like an Iridium Go. If you're using that for data, using the appropriate applications with it for 150 bucks a month, you can get unlimited data. That's 2,400 baud, mind you. So it's not a lot of data and it's, you know, uh, does require special applications. Um, but that's what you're that's what you're looking at. You know, really, you know, it it varies seasonally. You know, am I a three month user? Am I a six month user? Or am I a year long user? Uh, yeah, I know you? from a practical standpoint, uh, the first mate on my trips to Alaska, Margaret Palmer, convinced me to rent an Iridium Go from you two years ago, maybe three years ago, and we started downloading some of the NOAA websites to look at that. And, and we quickly ran up a bill uh, uh, way more than I would have thought. It took quite a while to download some of those web pages with basic uh, uh, chart, weather charts. And uh, we weren't using some of your software, which was probably our mistake, <laughs> but uh, it, 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 it shocked me how long it took to download it. Yeah, you're, you're really looking at, um data speeds that are extremely slow. You know, dial up was 56K. Uh, the Iridium network on the Iridium Go and the handhelds is 2.4K. So, you know, you thought dial up was slow. This goes way back. Um, loading up a site like just the NOAA website probably isn't even going to happen now because everything is a secured site. You'll notice every web page you go to is HTTPS now and that's yes. secured. That means it can't be compressed or anything. So you're just having to, to churn this big high security page over that 2.4K connection. And it's most likely going to time out. Um, what you want to do is look for applications that are designed for this that can take that data from NOAA and package it in a smaller format. And then the server is designed to communicate at 2400 baud and effectively download that that weather chart to you, for example. Right, uh, right. That's and let's, let, let's, let's let Leonard get in here with a question. Go ahead, Leonard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jeff, uh, speaking of that, on, on Iridium Go, is Predict Wind one of those applications that is that has compressed data or, or does compressed? And then my other question after that is, uh, can you talk a little bit about Iridium Go versus uh, Spot, uh, Spotify and uh, contrast or compare those two? I, sh I sure can. Um, so yes, Predict Wind is a uh, competitor to us, uh, non-disclosure or you know, full disclosure there. Uh, but they're so they're awful. <laughs> they're <laughs> terrible. Uh, they um, they provide weather information out to you, and they provide they are the only satellite system that they sell is the Iridium Go to kind of complement their weather package. So they're they're kind of a very you know two part thing. Here's Here's your weather. Here's your Iridium Go, um, and that's that's what they have to offer. But they are taking that weather data and trying to package it in a format that you can get it, you know, over that slow speed connection. Um, and so does that does that mean that they compress then? So by by having a, an Iridium Go that has an established relationship with Predict Wind, does that reduce the data requirements? So it's, it's not compression at this point. Uh, what's happening is you're downloading data that is uh, specifically formatted for, you know, to, to maximize the amount of information coming through in that data packet. You're looking at gridded binary weather files, grid files, and that particular data format is already a compressed format. So when it's downloading, you know, it, it doesn't get any smaller than that. And the way you control the size is by how many parameters are in that file. Like, am I getting wave, uh, you know, wind speed and direction? Am I getting wave information? Am I getting, you know, surface pressure data? How many layers 
of information am I getting in that data packet? And what is the geographic coverage area that I'm downloading for? Because the larger the area, the more data points, the more data you're downloading. Um, is that, I think that takes care of that one. Your next question was regarding the spot devices um, versus Iridium Go. So Iridium Go is a two-way communication device. So you can make voice calls, you can send and receive data. The spot device is a one-way communicator uh, and it works off the Global Star Network. And so when you push the button on a spot device to send either a tracking point or a quote message, uh, what's happening is it's sending a one-way message to the network and then the network on their side, they're either just redistributing your position information or they're looking at a database where you have gone in ahead of time and pre-programmed some specific voice or sp specific text messages. So you could say like, oh, when I hit the, the uh, message button, I wanted to send my message that I put in the website on slot one. And it says, hey, everybody, I'm doing fine. You, know, you don't get to change that when you're out at sea. You have to wait till you come back and get an internet connection to change that. And I'm, so familiar that also, that with, I'm familiar with that with the spot device, but uh, I guess I thought they had a Spotify device that was more like Iridium Go. Okay, you're talking about the SatFi 2. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, okay, SatFi. That's okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Global Star has another device uh, called the SatFi, and that yeah. is similar to the Iridium Go, uh, it, other than it works on their network and... Um, the technical specs, you know, would be faster data, cheaper airtime plans and all that kind of stuff. But that all falls into if you want to deal with uh, the ups and downs of the Global Star Network um, and the uncertainty that they have with their network at this time. And is the Global Star Network still the, uh, I want to say it, it does not have worldwide coverage, correct? Global Star does not have global coverage. Correct. Uh, the reason being their network is based off of a bent pipe uh, technology where when you make a call, that call goes directly to the satellite and that satellite rebroadcasts it directly to the nearest ground station and that's it. So you, that satellite has to be able to see both you and the ground station at the same time in order to complete that call. If only one part of that is in play, the call does not go through. Um, so as you get farther offshore, you're going to get farther away from a ground station and, and you're going to start dropping calls to where pretty soon you don't make any calls. Whereas Iridium, their satellites are cross-linked. So when you make a call, it's going to go to the Iridium satellite. If it can see a ground station, it'll go right there. If not, it's going to transfer across their satellites until it does reach the ground station. And most of the time that's in Arizona. Okay, and Iridium has 66 to 70 satellites up there at the time, correct? Correct, they have uh, 66 to complete uh, their fully operational network and that gives them 100% coverage of the globe. Global Star has um, less satellites. They have 24 of their second generation satellites up there and they're, they are farther up in altitude, uh, another 400 miles up from where the Iridium satellites are, but that still doesn't give them 100% coverage. You're still gonna have gaps between the sort of flashlight beam or spotlight beam that it hits the earth. And then you have to factor in the fact that it has to hit that ground station and you both within that beam at the same time. So, but so that's really the, the difference between the networks and I'm glad you pointed that out because sometimes it's hard to tell. Now Iridium has launched the, the CERTUS system. Is that the new network and new equipment? So the new network they've uh, branded Iridium Next and the CERTUS is the new kind of high-speed service that's uh, part of that program. So the CERTUS terminals are going to be a little larger terminals. They're going to be uh, like, uh, well, I have one sitting behind me somewhere. Uh, it's about a 10 inch diameter dome and it actually tracks multiple satellites at the same time. 
And um, that gives them data speeds, you know, they're much higher, you know, all the way up to 700 kilobits um, with that system. So it's a higher power antenna and uh, working off of those brand new satellites to do that. Huh. Okay. There will, be, there will be some new uh, smaller CERTUS equipment uh, coming out. You know, the current, the current price tag is about $7,000. Um, there will be some slower CERTUS systems coming out in the next few years. We're, we're probably looking about a year, year and a half out um, as they're still in development, but they may be cut the data speed down about half, and hopefully the price tag for that equipment will be about half, uh, but we're still a little bit, a little ways out on that. And that's what I was wondering. Like, look in your crystal ball, Jeff, that Katie got you for Christmas. What does it look like 10, 15 years from now? Where do you see technology and price? You know, that's, <laughs> that is the, that is the other question. You know, a lot of people call and they say, Hey, what, you know, is my equipment good now? Is it going to be good tomorrow? And um, I, I say, well, right now it's great. It's going to be good for the next, you know, three or four years, definitely, because it takes a long time for things to, uh, to change in the space segment. Uh, but as the likes of, you know, guys like Elon Musk and, you know, you're looking at Blue Origin, the, you know, Jeff Bezos stuff, you know, I think in 10 years, it's going to be different. But it's a bumpy road to get there. You know, there's a lot of regulatory stuff. There's a lot of money um, that goes into these systems. And there is a, um, people don't realize we're actually run out of bandwidth. So, you know, there's a finite amount of radio frequency available to people. And as these networks are developed, guys have to fight for this bandwidth. You know, they have to fight for that frequency band uh, to do stuff. And you hear a lot of talk about 5G. Mark, I mentioned uh, this earlier you know, off the show, but 5G. The show call, Mark. That's what Devin yeah. and I were talking about. Uh, I know. <laughs> The 5G stuff that you hear about in cellular, well, 5G, that frequency range is very close to both GPS and Global Star. So Global Star technically owns a bunch of the 5G frequencies that are being used. So there's huge regulatory uh, battles going on with them releasing these frequencies for terrestrial use. That's so let's, let's talk uh, at the lower end because... Uh, I think we were really pleased to see things like Garmin InReach. And then I noticed your company is promoting something I had never heard of called Zellos. And uh, tell us about both of those because they work and, and they're affordable, correct? Sure. The, uh, so uh, for these networks, uh, these, both of these devices, and it's Zolio to be exact, um, they are text, they are Let's see, on the Iridium network, you have voice and data, and then they have a data only chip, which is they use for sending short burst data, meaning text messages or dedicated uh, data if you're like monitoring, you know, wind farms or something like that. Well, these devices take advantage of just that small, smaller chipset and allow you to send short text messages very efficiently and at a relatively low cost. And you're looking at devices like the Garmin InReach, which was the Delorum InReach before. And that's just send text message, send a position report uh, back home. You're looking at equipment that's around three, $400 and airtime plans, you know, around $15 a month. And depending on how many messages you want to send, because now you're being billed on a per character basis uh, for these uh -huh. systems. Yeah, I've had great success cruising up and down between here and Alaska with uh, the InReach system and, and frequently recommend it. Uh, and uh, because I, I can send, I can accomplish so much that I can send a message. And if somebody needs then a telephone call, then I can say, well, I'll be within range of a cellular town or station by such and such. And I can call you then. And I find that works, it works reasonably well. I just can't always get the weather information I want. Yeah, um, so Katie and I, um, we've gone on many different trips, either cruising or camping. 
And uh, a great example was this summer, we came across the Okanagan uh, range with our trailer and uh, went a total of about 25 miles in two days of driving. <laughs> So, you know, we're way out of cellular coverage and luckily, you know, being a geek, I happen to have an Iridium system with me. And so we use that to communicate back to her parents to let them know we were okay and that we were gonna, you know, our trip's taking longer than we expected. We're gonna be now camping at 7,000 feet, you know, on this dirt logging, you know, mm -hmm. logging road out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, don't worry about us. We're okay. Yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> don't worry about us yet. And then, you know, we had another trip where uh, we were going to meet some friends. Well, the place we ended up going was out of cell coverage. And we had no way to let them know, you know, where exactly we were, what's our position, where should they drive to meet us. And again, had the Iridium system with us. I sent a position report and a short message to our friends said, here's where we are. You should be able to plug this into Google before you get off of your cell coverage and be able to find, you know, where you need to go, drive up and meet us and that kind of stuff. So that, you know, that's huge. So whether you have voice communications or just that text message to say, Hey, we're okay. You know, we're doing fine. Here's where you need to meet us or, you know, something more urgent, you know, I tend to rent a lot of phones to school districts and such that uh, take kids out on field trips and, you know, hiking trips and such like that, that uh, literally the first time one, I think it was SPU or something, they had a, a trip go out and they rented a phone because they're like, we're going to be out of cell coverage. We have a couple kids that, you know, we probably need to have something because of conditions, you know, whether it was diabetes or something like that. The day they, you know, the first time they took that phone out, they had a kid fall and break a leg and use that phone to call back and, you know, arrange a pickup and all that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, it has a lot more benefits than just, you know, checking, you know, your regular emails and stuff like that um, while you're out at sea. But answering fan email for Seattle Boat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, things like that. We get a lot that of that. That could be really important, though, you know. That could <laughs> be really right. important. Well, you, you talk Other about another thing. emergency rescue, and uh, Geos is, I've subscribed to it. Luckily, I've never needed to use it. And then I noticed just, what, six or eight months ago, Garmin bought the company. Is it really something that's useful if you get into an emergency situation? So the different satellite companies will... Uh, either point you in the direction of a company like Geos or, or similar, or they'll provide a service in conjunction with the equipment that you buy. Uh, for example, Iridium supplies you with a, a free subscription to one of the Geos basic levels. And the idea behind that is that when you pick up that phone, for example, on, on this particular Iridium handheld phone, you got the little SOS button on the top here. So if I'm set up with Geos, I can hit this button. It will send my position and a message to Geos, let them know that I'm in need of emergency assistance. They will then coordinate and have somebody come out and rescue me. And I think part of the program is a certain dollar figure of insurance is included in that. Um, so they have a number of different plans for you to, to check on. But um, depending on the actual equipment you buy, whether it's Iridium or Global Star uh, or MRSAT, you know, they may have a different company other than Geos, you know, provide that type of service. Sort of similar to the old, you know, the EPIR uh, business model, I guess. Right. But do not mistake it, it is not an EPIR. You know, when you hit that button, it went via satellite link to a ground station, not broadcasting so that, you know, the helicopter flying over looking for you does not pick up your little SOS signal off of this this phone. So it does not. If I noticed Geos years ago used to have what I call extraction coverage, which I thought would be really handy. And by the way, they also clearly said it is not valid for Afghanistan or Iraq. And I thought that was good information to let me know that just in case. But extraction coverage in that they would actually summon 
if possible, a helicopter to your location to remove you from that area, which right. uh, I've had some cruises that I, there were some people along on the trip that I- No, no names, Mark. Have. Yeah, no, let's Extracted. I, I won't name them on air, but uh, anyway. <laughs> But uh, a few questions in the chat. Any yeah. risk 5G will interfere with our GPS positioning precision? precision. Yes, I, it very much will. So throw that I out was going to put a plug in. That was part of my prep there, Jeff. I was going to uh, quote US Magazine, which is a fabulous magazine, actually covered this in their monthly cover story. And the answer is, as Jeff just stole my thought, yes, it, there's yeah. a potential there. And it's a great, great article. I'd link it, but they don't have it online yet. But check it out. But the short answer is that that could stand a reason. And that's about all I know about that subject, Jeff, if you'd like to elaborate, go for it. Well, uh, the best I have for you is, yeah, the, the frequency is very close to your GPS signal. And um, you'll know, notice that even on, on the boat, you know, when you go to put new electronics in, they tell you the minimum safe distance, you know, because certain equipment is operating at very similar frequencies. And for example, you put a Iridium antenna too close to your GPS antenna, when you are actively broadcasting on the Iridium system, it may knock out your GPS fix for that you know, few moments there because the frequency is, is gets too much noise in there and it can't filter it out. That same kind of thing. Now think of it, you've got a big tower on land broadcasting a very strong signal that's very close to that. Um, yeah, you will get degradation in your GPS fix. Thank you. Is Jeff. that why I get a buzzing in my head? That, that's a lot of it. That's the vodka. <laughs> I won't say it's all of it there, Mark, but that's a lot of it. Another my yeah, friend, uh, my friend, Alinda Newland, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, Leonard, did you want to jump in? Uh, I was going to, there was a question there that I, I'm curious with. Someone uh, asked, uh, Greg asked, uh, is Jeff familiar with the Nearshore network system that uses T Mobile network up the BC North Coast? Paired with tidal wave hardware, and uh, I, it fill me in. I have no idea what that is. So, uh, anybody know? Or do you know, Jeff? I do not know. I, I um, you know, I don't follow the cellular uh, systems very closely because that's really, you know, as time consuming in its own um, as the satellite uh, side of things. I do know that there are a lot of. Uh, it, it, Cellular is where the money is, right? So if there's people, if they have um, users in an area, they'll put up a tower. But it's taken a long time to get to some of these areas. But as the demand grows, the cellular companies realize that they should probably put towers up in that area before somebody else, you know, their competitor does. Um, that's the best I have for you on that. I just, the cellular is one, is something to follow you know, as closely as satellite, but it's just a little bit different. A couple other Thank questions. You. Linda's wondering about the spelling of geos, Jeff. Can you spell geos G -E for us? G-E-O-S. Okay. And you can, you can Google that and it'll explain that entire program. Excellent. And what about Starlink from our friend Willard Cox? Are, are we ready for that? Oh, I think we're ready for that. Yeah. We're, we're getting yeah, so the far. questions are coming fast and furious on this subject. So I think- Seven minutes left in the show. Okay. We, in about two hours, we'll get to this. So just stay tuned. <laughs> we know that Starlink was going to be the, the big the big magic question. Go for yeah. it. Yeah. So I'll give you my take on Starlink. Uh, I follow that because one, I'm a tech geek, and two, I'm in the satellite business. Um, the Starlink system is really cool. Uh, you know, those satellites are very close to the Earth, and they are moving. Um, so they are only a couple hundred miles up. If you look at Iridium, uh, they're about 400 miles up. Global Star is about 800 miles up. And Inmarsat is 22,000 miles out. So Starlink is very close to the Earth. In order to keep something in orbit that close, it's got to be flying. And that also gives them a very small footprint for each satellite. It can, it's just a very small radius that it's of the earth that it can see at any given time. Um, the first satellites they launched required a ground station to be nearby, very similar to Global Star. You had to be able to see you, the ground station, uh, simultaneously. Well, they are just now launching satellites that have cross-link capability oh. so that if you are in an area that's 
you know, kind of a stretch, they'll be able to link to another satellite and then back down to the ground station. Um, they've started with coverage up north, you know, the poles <laughs> are almost the poles, you know, Alaska was the first area to see Starlink working. And that's because the earth is a little smaller up there, you know, if you draw a circle around it. And as you get closer to the equator, everything's spreading out. So it takes more and more satellites to cover that area. So it requires them to get more, um, more asset in the sky. Well, as they're building this, we're starting to see service come down into Canada. And right now, um, we're starting to see availability in, you know, the northern part of Washington and, and kind of along the Canadian border there. Um, they're just now starting to release that to the public uh, to, to buy systems and such. Um, the and we should explain it's $500 for the ground equipment. And at the moment, roughly about $100 a month for pretty good internet speeds. Yeah, pretty good. And the, the big talk is the latency, you know, because we are still trying to reach a few hundred miles up. So when you, you know, hit, hit enter, it takes a moment for that signal to get up there and back. Um, there's a lot of regulatory stuff involved with uh, Starlink and they're duking it out with Amazon, with the likes of Global Star, you know, basically with everybody for bandwidth, again, like we mentioned earlier in the show. And um, also, the, because of the high frequency, the speed of these satellites, the sort of data speed that they want to be able to provide, they have to have a dish that's very focused on that satellite as it goes by. Well, that satellite's moving so fast that that dish would hook on to that satellite, and it's got to follow that thing across the sky real quick, like. And that's only got a, um, I forget what the exact number is. It's a little less than eight minutes for it to traverse the sky um, for Iridium. And I, I know these are much quicker. So you've got to have equipment that can track that satellite. So when we as boaters apply this to a boat, you know, okay, one, we've got a satellite moving across the sky, but the boat's moving at the same time. You know, boat's spinning around and tipping over and all this kind of and stuff. So now you've got to have a satellite dish and all these motors that are capable of doing all of that at the same time. And we throw one more curveball in there. It's like, do they have licensing to work everywhere in the world? You know, every country has their own regulations for frequencies and stuff. So just because the technology is there doesn't mean they're allowed to use it there. So right now That's it's it. covered in Canada and North America but land only, and they specifically do not have a license for mobile or nautical applications. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, you, you can't even put this on a, um, a vehicle, uh, you know, and drive around on land with it. It has to be at a fixed location. So, so it's going to be a while so far from what we can see until the technology is there for floating applications for something like Starlink. Right. We're going to, it's going to be a few years out. Um, you know, I think they're going to, I know they're, they talk about testing it on some of the landing platforms for the you know, rockets and such. Um, but those are very, you know, they're still asking for permission to test out there. So we've, we've got a little ways to go before we start seeing anything that's user-friendly. We've got a number of questions in the queue. Uh, we'd like to hear more about the in-reach device. You got maybe interrupted when we were talking about that one did you anything else you want to talk about the capability of it or otherwise um the in reach is just a if you haven't seen it um we don't sell those uh you would find those like go to best place just go to garmin website um or you could buy them through you know your local outdoor type store rei yeah uh, yep yeah. and they're just nice handheld units they do tracking i think you can get units that actually have uh, maps in them, you know, like all the other Garmin uh, GPSs. And then it gives you the ability to type in a message and send that message to somebody's email address or, you know, cellular phone number. Great. Thanks, Jeff. What about the Matsu 2500 system? Bob Sharp is asking. Matsu 2500. M-A-Z-U. Oh, Mazu. Yeah, well, yeah um, that's what okay. I said. <laughs> yeah, got it. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> So that, that is a Iridium-based system. 
So what they're doing is they have actually an Iridium modem built into that and they're sending data over that. So you'll look, I'm, I'm not familiar with the exact model number, um, where they are now, but their systems had a couple different, uh, you could buy into either the, the text only system, which would do weather and stuff, but it's using the short burst data system on the Iridium network. So everything's really technically being built on a per character basis where they have a new, they were going to be coming out with the newer system that was actually a full duplex Iridium modem in there so they could send and receive data and much larger data packets. So you could get more than just text or basic weather. You could actually get you know, weather charts and, and stuff in real different form. We, uh, we evaluated it uh, two and three years ago and it was a, it was a challenge. Uh, it was not up to uh, what I would expect. And, and so we, uh, uh, it, it, uh, I hope the newer systems are, are much better. It had promised, but at the time, uh, we, we did not find it as useful as it should be. For the amount of money, you know, it's kind of like uh, buying, buying some of the systems where they have a Sirius XM link for getting yes. weather information down. You, know, you tend to pay a lot of money for a very little amount of data or very, you know, rough data. And when yes, you can use it's a good way to put it. When you can use a service uh, like Oceans offers, um, you know, we can deliver any kind of weather information out to you on any of these platforms in a variety of formats, you know, whether it's text, a grid file, a next rad radar picture, a weather facts chart, you know, any of that kind of stuff, or pinpoint forecasts for your exact location on, you know, very highly accurate pinpoint forecast data. Uh, it's hard to justify spending a lot of money for a device that just kind of gives you a low res weather map like you get in your car. You know. I just want to add to that to say that uh, for those of you still, if we didn't get to your questions, the Oceans website, and I should spell it O-C-E-N-S dot com. European. <laughs> it's European, as one of my friends in the industry told me, because we left. I had, I had no idea. <laughs> uh, but it, there's a lot of information about all of these questions. And the one thing where I personally recommend Oceans is they also have a very, <coughs> a very robust rental program. So if you want to try before you buy, you can rent one of their systems, comes with the software you need, and it comes with some great people in Des Moines, Washington, like Jeff, who can provide you with the technical information to get it all working. How's that for a commercial? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, here's the bill. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, where's the bill? I took the took the <laughs> night off. Thanks, Leonard, for making me feel oh, weird. Yeah. Thanks for ruining it. I thought I, I got to minute 62 here. And then there you go. And for those of you interested, we have some questions coming up about the Zolio system. Again, it's a, it's very well described on the Oceans website. And uh, I can also give you Jeff's home number, but Katie's on the line, so I, I won't I won't do that. And Zolio spelled Z O L E O. That was a question. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Zolio yeah. is a new, a new product uh, on the market. It's a great price point, 200 bucks. Uh, very easy messaging. It's a text messaging system. Um, you use it with your smartphone, uh, the app on your smartphone. It's paired with the device itself. I don't have one with me, but it's very similar size to an Iridium Go. Um, nice little guy for, for packing around and, and, emergency communications and such so cool great question from mark could the 5g distortion of gps be dangerous when we cruise in populated areas where there are many 5g towers do we need to switch on our radar to check our gps precision oh boy wow uh no i don't think you need to switch on your radar to check your gps position i think running your radar is always good because it's the real picture of physical things around you as opposed to a plot, plot uh, positioned on a, a map on a chart plotter, which can be off as we've all seen. So uh, good question though, boy, that's a tough one. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I think we beat this one to death tonight. No, this is awesome. Thank you, Jeff and Katie. Uh -huh. And Katie, wish, we, didn't, uh... we, did, we weren't able to throw you any tough questions. 
<laughs> I was noticing there was one about an antenna. Oh, I could do yeah. that one. Yes, you can please. do antenna questions. <laughs> I can answer the antenna questions. Go for it. I, I will tell you right now, though, that uh, when we have the communications out there, I'm usually yelling at her to send somebody a message, and she's the one actually doing it. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, you're yelling, maybe just encouraging Jeff. You're just encouraging. Oh, right, encouraging. Yeah, from the helm. You know how that works. Sure. Yep, yep, yep. Well, so, Peter, I, I think. Yeah, we actually. That, I'm, well, I'm curious. I'm going to ask you to call a quick timeout. What's going on two weeks from now, Leonard? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. You know, yeah. what's your plan? Two weeks from that today, not next week, but two weeks from today, uh, we're going to have SR3 on. Uh, this, the theme here is Des Moines, uh, because SR3 is a search, they're a response, rehab, and rescue uh, organization, nonprofit organization that deals in marine mammals, uh, marine animals, basically. And they're out there if they're entangled animals, uh, these folks are there to help them, to rehab them, and do research. And they're located down in Des Moines. They've just finished their location. They're going to be on with us in two weeks. And uh, we're going to learn some very interesting stuff. I think they have some excellent pictures uh, to go with it. And so I invite you to stay tuned in two weeks. That, that's not to imply that we'll be taking next Thursday off because we'll be here just like we're here. No, no, Thursday, the, the La know. Landons are taking, they've got a, a different engagement. Oh, must be nice. Yeah. Okay. For that yeah. night, that sounds, so that sounds excellent. They're, they're leaving you and I to carry it, oh, Peter. That's, I, I, that's first and last before make that we mistake. go, before yeah. we go, I think Katie needs to answer the question about the antenna. Oh, oh okay. So <laughs> what it, it was about the inReach, and it said, or no, the Iridium Go. And if you are planning to use the Iridium Go down below deck, then yes, you need an antenna. Otherwise, if you're just going to carry it up on deck and deploy the antenna that comes with it. Then you don't need an extra antenna, but it oh. is it is um, encouraged that if you're going to use it below decks, that you do have an extra antenna mounted. And we didn't get a chance to talk too much about the Iridium Go, but the nice thing is the user interface is your smartphone mm -hmm. for text for anything. So mm -hmm. it talks to your smartphone, I guess, over Bluetooth, correct, or Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, very good, very good. <laughs> Double check. <laughs> yeah. And Mark, before we go, did, uh, did you need to say anything about Grosbeck? I wanted to thank them for their sponsorship, Mark. Would you thank like to you, put Peter. a finer point on that? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. did look today at their website to see what they have. There's some great properties on there, some land, a couple of homes in, in Anacortes. And uh, uh, yep, give Jean Grosbeck and her crew a call if you're interested in buying up in this area. Uh, we recommend it. Leonard, Marina, and I uh, uh, have all bought homes in this area in the last two years, and we're, we're pretty happy. There's the happy crew at Grossbeck and Associates. Some of their so, properties. Uh, yeah. Peter, I think we got our sponsor in. We, we did it all. Yeah, session. you know, I think we're going to end it tonight. Actually, because we did so much talking about space, uh, we're going to end it with the showing of the big landing today. The perseverance, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, so you I, got it all set up. I got. I. I don't watch me break it. I'll break the internet <laughs> here. But uh, I met. If you, just use your imaginations, boys and girls. No. Um. I, yeah. I think we'll end it that way. Episode thirty-five. That was Ralph Nader hosting that back in the day. Uh, but wow. yeah. So I want to thank that uh, Jeff and Katie Thomason. If I said that correctly, I hope I did. If I did, yeah. please correct me. <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. Rain, right. Great to see you all. And Mark, appreciate Rizzo, you guys. Have a great evening. Thank you. And we're gonna go out watching the. Uh, we're gonna go out watching. The, uh, <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> click a little farther. Yeah, I got this. I got this, Jeff. You, you worry about satellites. You're uh, right. Okay. Here we go. We're gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. Yep. It's getting warmer. There it's we go. Late. The, uh, there we go. Pretty cool here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I assume that's the control <laughs> room. This was about five hours ago. Yeah, I didn't know I'd be doing play by play. This is my first play by play for a Mars landing, Mark. But yeah, we're live here at four. Oh, not live, but this is at four o'clock today, Pacific Standard Time. There it is. So I do got it. I got one more thing to throw in at you. Um, this, this, watching this video here, I have a picture of my son at two years old sitting on my chair, staring at a computer looking at imagery that we were downloading directly from a NOAA satellite. And I have this little picture of him wearing, you know, our company shirt and all that kind of stuff. And he, he always look at me, he goes, dad, I can't do that right now. I'm talking to robots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and he looks just like one of these guys in the control room here. Of course. Without the mask. So Jeff and Katie, how is it that you had a geek kid? Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> we actually raised four kids together, yeah. believe it. Two of them are geeks. Two are major geeks. <laughs> <laughs> Two are major geeks. That's great. We need them. We need them. Right. That's right. I've got one of them that I raised. I know exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. oh, great mm -hmm. stuff. Well, cool. Peter, well, you all have, a, have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next Thursday. It was fun. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night.